Welcome back to the panel discussion, Building the Hybrid Cloud, sponsored by Red Hat on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Our guest today are Eric Simmon. He's the systems expert in the cloud computing program at NIST. Gunnar Hellickson is chief strategist in the Red Hat's U.S. public sector group. And Gerard Shelak, director of the technical services division in the Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies at GSA. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. And Eric, I want to start with you because I understand that NIST has several activities underway, new ones, uh, for cloud and how you go forward with cloud computing. So tell us about those. Right. So the first phase of NIST activities in supporting uh, both the USG migration to cloud as well as private industry was to create the uh, U.S. government cloud computing roadmap and look at uh, uh, reference architecture and what the challenges are and, and barriers are into achieving the full capabilities of cloud. Uh, we laid out 10 priorities in that roadmap. Now we're moving on to phase two, where we're starting to focus more on addressing those priorities. And in that vein, we have recently spun up three new working groups. Uh, these are public working groups open to anybody who wants to participate. Uh, the first one is uh, Interoperability and Portability Public Working Group, which will look at the issues associated with both interoperability and portability. The second is one focusing on the service characteristics, uh, specifically going to not just the three service models, but where specific types of services fit within the service model, um, helping us understand better uh, what the different services are that are provided. And finally, we have a, a federated cloud public working group, which will look at the implementation and um, monitoring and management of complex multi-cloud systems. And all three of those, again, are open to anybody uh, to participate in. And if you're interested, that uh, information is available on the NIST cloud computing uh, website. All right, so that brings up a good question for Gerard. As you are dependent now in innovative services on so much cloud, uh, and you mentioned innovation is really important. That's, that's the name of your section of GSA. So what do you look uh, at in the future? How do you make sure that, uh, how are you going to make sure that the cloud services that you're using support your real goal, which is innovation? Well, I think, you know, we need to reach the next level of maturity, and I think automation is a, is a key a component of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of the old traditional approach to managing virtual machines that transferred over as we moved into the cloud. Um, but, you know, we're looking at, at being able to do builds, being able to do deployments and automate things in tools like Puppet or Chef and uh, so that uh, we can have more of a DevOps approach towards things. Um, we, we can integrate the operations and development teams and that they can work innovatively together. And that, I think, speeds things up. It, it cre you know, there's a it, it eliminates the big barrier when you have separate organizations responsible for those two two aspects of, of uh, application development. So you want to not be touching the individual parts of the cloud environment so much, but have that kind of automated in some way at an operational level? Yeah, I, I think that's that's the key there, because operations is where most of the time is really and money is really spent. Um, and so if, if we can automate things, we can speed things up, we can reduce cost, um, we can share better across across the organization, not just within our own office. Um, so I think that those are key elements. I think some of the, like I mentioned earlier, some of the tools that are coming out that are geared towards managing across hybrid clouds uh, are really going to facilitate that. Yeah, and Gunnar, one of the words we hear nowadays coming into the lexicon is cloud orchestration. Mm -hmm. That sounds a little bit about what, like Gerard was talking about, the yeah, idea sure. of automating in the complex environments. What, what do you hear about that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's absolutely mandatory, right? Um, it's a, it was one thing when we were managing servers by hand um, that we were barely able to do that when they were physical and actually in structures that we controlled. Um, once they're outsourced um, or spread across multiple providers, um, it becomes basically impossible to do this stuff by hand. Um, so we need to figure out ways of automating uh, the work that we're doing. And so these cloud orchestration tools like Red Hat's Cloud Forms um, and the tools like Puppet and Chef and so forth um, go a long way towards taking a lot of that 
uh, busy work, let's call it. Um, important work, but still busy work. Taking it off the table, um, automating it, um, and freeing up labor to go focus on, frankly, much more interesting problems um, and focus on areas of innovation rather than areas of standardization. Now, there used to be, I mean, well, not used to be, there still are uh, different vendors that offer courses and certification in use of their particular technologies, mm -hmm. especially as they become widely deployed. And you know who all those vendors are. There's mm -hmm. hundreds of them. Do you see cloud management and cloud choice and how to orchestrate all that cloud material on behalf of your organization? Is that emerging as a specialty in and of itself? That's an interesting question. I think uh, there, will, there will always be kind of product-specific certifications and training, right? That, that's always going to be the case. Um, but for cloud uh, modes of operation, right, or the cloud idiom, I mean, you mentioned DevOps earlier, Gerard. Um, I think the idea of getting a certification in DevOps uh, seems, uh, seems maybe a bridge too far. Um, I think that uh, training and certification... Uh, while important for products, um, the ways in which we use those products is changing so quickly um, that it's going to be a long time before it's standardized to the point where we can stick somebody into a classroom for a week and teach them how to do it. Um, and I think that's for the good. Um, the air, innovation in, especially in IT operations, has just exploded over the last few years. Um, and you saw a lot of creativity and a lot of great new tools entering that space, which we haven't seen before. Um, and I think that's the way we like it. Uh, we actually like all the innovation and all the change and the churn. Um, it actually helps us a lot. Um, back when we thought we had solved this problem, um, we weren't doing it very well. Um, so, so it sounds like the emphasis might be moving a little bit away from simply operational expense reduction, you know, the CapEx and mm -hmm. OpEx, towards a world of operational excellence mm -hmm. uh, as, we, as we move more things in the cloud in these complex environments. Fair, fair way to put it? Yeah, I think we're, uh, rather than, uh, I think we, we think we know how to optimize for capital expenses and we think we know how to optimize for operating expenses. And so now I think our attention rightfully is turning towards optimizing for things like innovation, um, which is, uh, which frankly, may, I mean, makes our, our industry a lot more interesting um, than it has been in the last 20 years. Right? All right. So, Eric, that gets back to the uh, three main points of the activities that you're talking about. And the first one you mentioned was portability and interoperability. So that sounds like you're talking also to the application people as well as to the cloud people, because uh, as we talked about earlier, interoperability depends on some measure on how you design your apps. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the, just to be clear, uh, portability is the ability to move data from one system to another. Interoperability is the ability of the systems to actually work together and interact um, interoperability is usually needed for portability, but interoperability is something that happens in real time, whereas portability is something that uh, doesn't happen in real time. Um, and let me just follow up on one point, again, not to get too deep in the weeds, but we will, because it's fun. Uh, and that is the idea of multiple sources coming together, multiple data sources coming together to feed some application, maybe a mobile app, that is not really bolted to that data source. So can, is NIST envisioning a situation where you might have your application in one cloud and your data in several other clouds and that, some way of making that work together? Absolutely. Um, and that is, I think, the next generation of cloud that we want to go to. Uh, we want to maximize our uh, benefit from the cloud, and that means looking at the performance and the functionality provided by different clouds and combining them to better meet our needs. Um, doing that's going to be a challenge. The two main challenges for interoperability uh, in a very general sense are syntactic interoperability, that is the structure, the format that data is in. Uh, the semantic interoperability is the much bigger issue and that is the concepts and the relationship between those concepts. And if you have semantic issues, ontological issues, then sometimes you have really big interoperable problems. Whereas if it's just format, just syntax, those are usually uh, solvable issues. Now, each cloud vendor has developed their own systems, which actually has semantic and syntax differences. So how we enable this interoperability, how we you know, promote this sort of innovation of combining different clouds is going to be a challenge. 
Gunnar, comment? Yeah, so the, um, there's, a, there's a technology that's come around very quickly. Just over the last year, it's emerged uh, out of the open source community. Uh, like the rest of cloud technology, it's come out of the open source community, and it addresses uh, some of these interoperability and portability issues in a really interesting way. Um, Red Hat is, is investing in it um, a great deal, so are other companies. It's a technology based on Linux, and it's called Docker. Um, and it allows you to take workloads and put them into these uh, reusable containers. Um, and so instead of taking a workload and putting it into a cloud provider, we can take the workload, put it into a container, and then move that container around amongst many different cloud providers. And it happens very easily. Uh, Google has been using this technology for years now. I think they start and stop uh, over 2 million containers a day. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, very exciting. Um, and so... Uh, it sounds like a variant of virtualization. It's well, it's a light. Think of it as a lightweight virtualization, and uh, being able to use tools, uh, our uh, CloudForms tool, uh, as well as other vendors' tools. Um, once we have all the work, once all the workloads look the same to these management tools, um, it opens the door towards interoperability amongst management tools as well. Um, in addition to interoperability amongst the providers, it's very exciting stuff. So uh, we will be we will be present on Eric's uh, Eric's working group to, <laughs> to talk about that. Yeah, all right, Gerard. So how do you think all this? might uh, roll up to what you're trying to do to deploy innovation to the government and to citizens. And I guess the question I would zero in on is uh, mobile and the idea of mobile first. A lot of mobility seems to be enabled by the ability of these various data sources and application sources to come together at the client level, which is a mobile device. Uh, are you in innovation services looking at mobility as a, as a big area of growth for you? And can the cloud support that? Well, I think that there's a real challenge in, in getting the ubiquity of data. You know, data still has a home, and, and without replication, it has only one home. And so, you know, trying to address that layer, I think, is a challenge where, you know, we, we put data in the cloud and we want to know that it is going to be available without having to go through all the underlying architecture necessary to do replication. I think that's a challenge. And, and I... I haven't really seen a solution to that. I mean, we've looked at NoSQL type databases, MongoDB, things like that, that we're working on to see if that can help us in that area. Um, but um, we're still trying to, you know, come figure that out. Yeah, because replication is something you want to try to avoid because the more copies of a thing you have, the more traffic, and that could really affect your responsiveness. Right, and and also, you know, perhaps the integrity of the data too. If there's any, you know timing sequences and replication that, that don't happen as they're supposed to. Sure. I know somebody talked a little bit earlier about how some, like, the, the application, whether it's architected for availability or, or for integrity or two, is a question you need to grapple with up front. But, you know, if you need that integrity, then, you know, we want that reliability of the data store. Sure. Gunnar? Yeah, we've, we've, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because uh, we've seen this sudden surge of interest in, uh, in uh, technology we've got called a Gluster, uh, which is actually used by NASA on the Mars rover. Did you um, say Gluster? Gluster is the name of it, right. So when uh, when the Mars rover was up and they had the live video feed, remember that? And everybody hit the website basically at the same time looking at live video from Mars, which well, was super cool. Well, people bought computers because of the existence of that information. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so... Uh, that live video, when the Mars rover sent it, was being sent to Amazon um, and uh, and also to NASA headquarters. Um, and they needed a way of ensuring consistency between what was on the NASA premises and also what was on the Amazon premises. They used this Gluster tool, which made uh, gave that data made that data available to both sites simultaneously um, and allowed them to kind of smear the data over both their on-premise work and their off-premise work, which made it very simple for their application to scale up uh, inside the Amazon cloud. It was very exciting. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're excited to see where that uh, storage technology goes. All right, so we just have a few minutes left, and so we'll give each of you 45 seconds or so. We'll start with you, Gerard. Uh, just in a nutshell, uh, what do you hope to do cloud-wise uh, going into the next year or two, and how do you hope to get it done? Well, a couple of things we're working on. We're trying to put some governance model in place, um, but one that can support innovation. So we need to balance that. Um, we're looking really to to build out the platform services. You know, we're, we're really a lot of effort right now is and a lot of attention is in the infrastructure services. But we really want to get to that platform layer, um, which enables the developers to to you know to deploy code and to worry about that solutions as opposed to the underlying infrastructure and then also i think part of that is is developing this devops concept and really pushing that forward too so that again that there's a that there's a team effort going on between operations and and applications 
And Eric, the three initiatives you have going, portability, interoperability, the, uh, the uh, perf uh, service requirements and characteristics, and also managing, managing complex environments, if I got them all right, what is your output going to be, or do you know yet, and what's kind of the roadmap for those initiatives? Uh, well, I think all three groups will have a little bit different uh, output. Uh, out of the third service working group, we'll have a list of services with their descriptions and how they fit in with the three service models, as well as explaining how you deal with kind of overlap between the service models. Uh, the other two groups will probably produce something about the uh, just suggestions, guidelines for ensuring interoperability and, and portability, as well as how you implement federated clouds. Okay, and these are open to the public, you say, to government people and to industry and to anyone that's interested in cloud computing? Absolutely. Anybody, uh, both domestically and internationally, is welcome to join, uh, and we, we value all participants. I did want to make one more comment since I've heard standards mentioned a couple of times that uh, NIST view on standards is that we want to use these standards to actually promote the innovation that was talked about. So good standards will help us innovate, help us achieve the real potential of cloud. All right. And Gunnar, you got the last 20 seconds. Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm I completely agree that uh, standards are important. I think that um, standards and commoditization are an important part of the trend here. Um, taking the stuff we know how to do and making it boring uh, so that we can go focus on the more interesting stuff, the innovative stuff. Um, and that is, and I'm excited to see how open source is, uh, is going to enable that in the future. All right. I'd like to thank our guests. That brings us to our close. Uh, Gerard Shelak is Director of the Technical Services Division in the Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies at GSA. Eric Simmon is a systems expert for the cloud computing program at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And Gunnar Hellickson, chief strategist in Red Hat's U.S. public sector group. I'm Tom Temin, federalnewsradio.com and 1500 AM. On behalf of Red Hat, thank you for joining us for this informative discussion. You'll be presented with some polling questions as you leave the webinar to help us improve future sessions. We appreciate your feedback. We'll have the archive from this session available shortly, and a link will be sent to you for you to share with your colleagues. Those of you who requested a training certificate for this webinar should receive it in the next two weeks. Be sure to register for upcoming webinars from the Capital Exchange. Look for upcoming sessions at www.fedinsider.com events. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you. <laughs>